say this morning. Uh, so I can't believe it. will be realised. I thank you for coming this morning. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? It's a problem more than 50 years away for these young musicians, but that doesn't stop them putting plenty of feeling into their performance. 120 of the most talented primary school children in The Hunter have converged on the Myuna Bay Sport and Recreation Centre for a week-long musical camp. Many, like Katara's Cameron Whiteside, have never played in a band before, and they're revelling in the experience. I usually have to just practice at home by myself. This is the first time. How are you finding it? Well, it's really good fun. It's the 16th time the camp has been held and the results are starting to show. Organisers say this group is the best yet. Well, the standard is really up. Um, in previous years, um, the kids haven't been able to perform music of near the standard that they're, they're performing this year. Um, which is probably some evidence of that in the, in the region with bands doing really well in the Hunter region. And it's no wonder, in the five days they're here, the children will cram in almost 30 hours of intensive practice. Great for their blossoming skills and great fun for students and staff alike. Just last weekend, the growing problem of street crime in Newcastle came under the spotlight with the launch of a new police enforcement aimed at curbing the trend. Operation Clean Sweep led to almost 50 charges on Saturday night, but afterwards police admitted that while late night trading in the inner city continues, they'll be fighting an uphill battle. But today, nine of the city's social hotspots have decided to throw their weight behind the crackdown, combining to launch the night spot tripper bus. Every Friday and Saturday night, starting tomorrow, the brightly coloured UTA bus will roam the city streets, picking up and dropping off free of charge revellers at nine designated stops. It's the brainchild of the licensees of those premises, who at a recent meeting admitted they weren't happy with what their city was becoming in the wee small hours. While it's all well and good to have a place full of people partying and uh, having a great time, at the end of the night your till looks terrific and uh, you've made a, a commercial opportunity, I think effectively that uh, you have a responsibility to your patrons and, and the city to ensure that there is a safety element there and you have to act responsibly. And so concerned are the licensees that they're actually paying to have the bus operate. Each will contribute $35 every night the bus is on the road. The night tripper will operate constantly between 9.30pm and 3.30am. At that time it's expected to make about 13 round trips, starting at Queen's Wharf servicing the QE2 and the brewery, then on to Leroy's, the Jolly Roger, the Castle, the Cambridge Hotel, Nexus, Knights Tavern, Palais and back to the waterfront. Newcastle Police have given the concept hearty approval. Today, Patrol Commander Inspector Ian Cleary said for far too long police had been little more than a taxi service for the inebriated. But now the night tripper would leave them free to get on with a job of full-time patrolling. They won't be on the street, they'll be on the buses and uh, there'll be less assaults on the street and we are very, very pleased with this initiative and we congratulate them very, very much. Patronage of the tripper over the first three months will be used to gauge its future. However, John Clune, licensee of the Cambridge Hotel and one of the bus's most staunch supporters, says he's confident it will remain. We are approaching it optimistically as a long-term and permanent feature of the city's uh, night entertainment. Ultimately, the test of whether it's successful or not is, lies with the people who use it. And while ever they use it, we will support it. Everything continuing to look very good. 
A new era in astronomy began today as the Discovery astronaut slowly lifted the Hubble telescope out of the cargo bay, preparing the flagship of a fleet of new space observatories for its maiden voyage. But it was not easy, and it became a race against time. The telescope's two giant solar wings, shown here in speeded up action, had to be deployed within eight hours before the onboard batteries failed. Although the astronauts were behind schedule due to minor nagging problems, Eventually, they were able to unfurl the first 40-foot-long solar array. But with just three hours left on the clock, there was trouble ahead as they attempted to deploy the second solar array. It was stuck. Only one of five panels came out. The release of the telescope was postponed for at least one orbit. And with a little over two hours left on the clock, astronauts Bruce McCandless and Kathy Sullivan were told to get ready for an unscheduled spacewalk, or EVA, so they could crank the panels open by hand. However, the engineers thought the problem was caused by an oversensitive safety device. So they turned it off and made one last attempt. Discovery all is looking well. So we have good news. We have full deployment of the starboard wing. The crisis was averted. The spacewalk canceled and Hubble was finally ready. The Hubble telescope was released with just an hour to spare before its batteries would have died. Hubble is now on its 15-year voyage to pry secrets from the universe. From Darlington, South Carolina, Combs heads a strong field of 24 NASCAR late model sedans. Combs will come face to face with current national champion Ross Nicastri and former title holder John Smith from Singleton. Newcastle will be represented by cowboy Graham Lilford driving a Pontiac Firebird and he will be joined by former state champions Fred Seary and Walter Giles. Formerly known as Grand Nationals, the big brutes at the Speedway circuit have been limited in their appearances at the Motodrome this season, and with a hard-charging American in the field and a hot group of Aussie throttle shakers in pursuit, it will be a sight to behold for race-starved enthusiasts. Musselbrook, home to 11,000 people, five pubs and four clubs. For adults, it's a cosy environment, but for those under 18, it's a bleak, even boring scenario. There's um, some facilities here, but they're limited in what they can provide. And uh, youth problems are very major. To combat the problem, Musselbrook community leaders are hoping to establish a youth centre in the former Elcom Apprentice Training Facility. The building alone will cost $310,000, but in the six weeks since an appeal for funds was launched, a massive $135,000 has already poured in. Joint Coal Board Chief Jack Wilcox today presented the committee with a cheque for $30,000 and a timely reminder of the consequences of the lack of youth amenities. In the street outside my, uh, my terrace where I live, uh, the young bloke got into a, a, a brawl there last night and a couple of others were involved and uh, a few boots went in and this kid, uh, 22 years of age, finished up in hospital last night. Still, despite the overwhelming community response, the hard work is far from over. With another 175000 just for the purchase of the building, uh, to finalise that, certainly is a big target, but I have every confidence in this area uh, that we can achieve it. We have looked at that very closely and we've budgeted for it and we are very, very confident this community can support such a activity. Still, police and public alike are hoping when the centre finally does open in about six months' time, it will be the key to cleaning up street crime. It's a salute to the blood, sweat and tears of the men who have laboured in Hunter Mines. The setting is an underground mine and its creators believe it's as close to the real thing as you can possibly get. 
It's all very well for us to talk about uh, numbers and production, but we want to give people the smell and the feeling of what it's like to work underground. And just how authentic is it? You can't get much more authentic than this. These are the real machines. They've been dragged out of the mines and dragged in here. Even the rock in, uh, that we've used around is uh, the real stuff. It's hardly any wonder the finished product is authentic. It's been more than two years in the planning and 16 months in the making. In fact, as late as this afternoon, its four-man building team was still hard at work putting the finishing touches on the intricate scale model, which is to be the exhibit's centrepiece. But while these small models are sure to be admired for their authenticity, there's also certain to be plenty of interest for the life-size pieces. More than 80 tonnes of machinery is featured, including this continuous miner donated to the museum by a local company when it first opened. The walls and ceiling surrounding it have been carved out and painted, bearing startling similarities to a real mining environment. Visitors will be invited to sit on the miner and feel how it really works, though the machine will remain shut down for obvious safety reasons. The exhibition is to be launched tonight and is destined for a long future at the museum. Management is confident it will become a big crowd puller, particularly this weekend when entry to the museum is free. This was the scene in Newcastle's Harborside suburbs last night. 30 centimetres of water covered many of the streets, with residents watching the rising waters at their doorsteps. Police cars patrolled the area and blocked the streets to traffic, but nothing could be done as the king tides welled back up the drainage system. Today, there was plenty of evidence to show where the water had been, although most of it had drained away. The Water Board says it can do nothing to fix the problem, which has been made worse by the flood-swollen Hunter River. And the tide is the third highest ever recorded in Newcastle Harbour. But for residents who endure the water lapping into their homes, these excuses offer little comfort. Marjorie Hardy has lived in Wickham 25 years. She's been told the flooding makes her house inhabitable. I'm petrified. I'm absolutely petrified. I'm sick. I don't know what I'm going to do. Deborah Mondi's had enough. She's packed her belongings and is moving out for good tonight. Pack up and leave. Get out of it. Quick as we can. Residents have had to face these kind of wash-ups before and they'll have to do it again. Tonight, in fact, just after 10 o'clock, another two-metre tide is forecast. John Church, NBN News. The tournament was washed out over Easter and today the semi-finals and final were played. Dalton in the blue struggled to beat Paul Norris 31-30 in one semi, while John Snell was an easy winner over Beresfield's Barry Salter. With a green that was a slick 17 seconds, it took a little time for both bowlers to find their range. But when they did, excellent lawn bowls was the order of the day. One of the features of John Snell's play has been his tremendous accuracy with the drives. And on the second end, he was bang on target and signalled to all and sundry that it was going to be a long day. And a long day it has been. While Snell had the firepower, Dennis Dalton proved to be the stayer and after a marathon game took line honours 31 to 28. The problem is due to a combination of the King Tide and the rain-swollen Hunter River, which is forcing water back up stormwater drains and onto the streets of Newcastle's low-lying suburbs. For long-time residents, it is not the first time water has lapped the front door of their homes, but tonight's tide is expected to be higher than ever, and they hold little hope that it won't inundate their homes. The young couple who rent this house moved in only this afternoon. Now, two hours after unpacking their belongings, they've been forced to move them to the bench tops because the floor material under the lino is beginning to swell with water. Hugh, I'm good. just wondering what the council's going to do about well, the situation. Well, the council's trying to do something. They've, uh, they've had a look at the, uh, the, 
They've had a look at the valves over here to try and see if they can get fixed so that they can stop the backwater coming back up the uh, up the drainage system. How quickly will that happen? Well, I don't know how quickly it'll happen because it's a, a problem that belongs to the water board. And uh, regrettably, the tides coming up, they're king tides, and uh, the tides, of course, coming up at Stockton as well as uh, other locations, and there's nothing we can do about it at the moment. Around 13,000 police stormed the Hyundai Heavy Industries shipyard in Ulsan on Saturday to crush a three-day strike. It's the largest shipyard in the world and the raid quickly sparked protests and demonstrations. Thousands of workers fought with rocks and firebombs in running street battles with police. The unrest spread to Seoul, where over a thousand students demonstrated against the raid. They hurled hundreds of firebombs in fights with riot police, temporarily paralysing traffic on main streets. Unions across the country joined in the protest, demanding the release of jailed labour leaders and vowing to hold nationwide strikes to protest the raid. They say 15 of the 32 Hyundai companies nationwide have already pledged support. Alison Peters, NBN News. The travelling exhibition offers a second chance to glimpse those front page pictures from Australia's top newspaper photographers. 300 winning entries are on display in the Commonwealth Bank's New Common Street branch. These images of 1989 captured the Sydney Morning Herald's Paul Matthews, the title of Australian Press Photographer of the Year. The grounded oil tanker Chorus won Craig Golding of Fairfax second place. The six categories include best news photographs, the Wong kidnapper arrest and man running from Wynnum shooting. In sport, Mal Meninga's victory cry and Alan Border's victory at last show how sweet it is. There are the triers, the triumphs and tragedies, the indelicate and the lighter sides of life. The display continues until Friday and then goes on to Gosford. Wally Lewis's injury against Norths last Friday may have put him off the field, but not out of the selectors' minds. The King has worked some miracles before, but even eight hours a day of constant physiotherapy will be unlikely to repair his damaged hamstring. Waiting in the wings is heir apparent to the Crown, Newcastle's Michael Hagan. Obviously if he's not fit, um, it's a risk that he's taking and uh, you know, may jeopardise the team's chance of winning the series this year. Will you be sending him any get well cards over the next couple of days? Oh mate, I, uh, like I said, I, you know, you'd hate to wish that upon him, but uh, if I get an opportunity, I'll, I'll make the most of it. Hagen's not new to the rigours of State of Origin League, and the classy knight isn't getting big-headed over his chance to wear the coveted number six. They're fairly big shoes to fill, but uh, you know, I think he's he's uh, reigned at Lang Park for a long time, and I think it'll be a long time before someone uh, emulates his deeds up there. Hagen's teammate and fellow banana bender Jeff Doyle missed out on selection. While Doyle has been playing some excellent football, it's thought the Knights' poor showing over the last three weeks has ruined his chances. At work today, Hagen was calculating his game plan for the match. He leaves to join his new teammates in Brisbane on Thursday, still unsure of his standing. They'll slot me in at training, so it gives you plenty of time to get used to players and, uh, and calling moves and stuff like that. So. Um, I'll just prepare myself as though I am playing and if Wally does play well I'll um, make the most of it when I get, if, I, if and when I get on the field. With Hagen out for the state of origin, McCormack moves into 5-8 for Newcastle against St George on the weekend. Peter Johnston takes over as captain, second rower David Mullane moves up to firsts. And in a shock move, former captain Sam Stewart has been dropped to reserve grade.
A year and a half ago, much fanfare greeted the opening in Newcastle of one of Australia's most unusual nightclubs. Today, though, all that was forgotten as workmen began dismantling Windward Passage 2. The entire boat was to be shifted today, but because the club and fannies are under the one licence, police refused to allow the boat to be moved. It's hoped the necessary paperwork will be completed next week, which will allow owner Rod Muir to transport the hull and mast to his home on the central coast. At this stage, Mr Muir says he has no plans for the hull, but it's believed it may be up for sale for $20,000. Meantime, the fixtures and fittings from Windward Passage have been bought by local entrepreneur Richard Owens. Just a few weeks ago, Mr Owens purchased the vacant Key One complex, which he has now leased to the Newcastle Workers Club. The club will temporarily occupy the building and establish a car park on the Windward Passage site until construction on the club in King Street is completed in December next year. Jody McKay for MBN News. Both golfers have dominated the junior Australian scene over the past few years while retaining their amateur status. Now the trip of a lifetime, playing some of the best courses in the world and against top players on the European tour. Wayne Stewart, off a scratch handicap, is a young man with enormous potential and along with Lucas Parsons and Lester Peterson has been invited to participate in the British amateur tournament at Muirfield in Scotland. Further events in London, Austria, Denmark and the French Open follow and he has been granted entry into one of three qualifying events for a start in the British Open, where more than 800 hopefuls will be seeking the final six spots. For the likeable lad from Toronto, the tour will decide his future. I think it's uh, very important in an aspect of uh, future um, ideas of turning professional. When I come home I'll have a fair idea then, whether I'm good enough or not. Wayne's girlfriend, Dale Linnitson, plays off five and has recorded some fine victories during her junior career. Dale will probably play the British ladies amateur, but most of her time will be spent assisting Wayne. I'm looking forward to playing myself, but my priority will be with Wayne and his schedule. Do you know much about the women's tour in England? Uh, not a great deal. Uh, I've had information from the ladies' golf union and they've been very helpful, but uh, not personal experience, no. With any luck, Wayne Stewart will return to Newcastle and take up a pro career and follow in the footsteps of fellow Novocastrians Jack Newton, Bob Shaw and John Clifford.